welcome to Global Perspectives. I'm David Dumpke here with Katie Coronado. Today we are joined by Congressman Luis Gutierrez, who in addition to representing his Chicago-based district for 26 years, has been a leader on Hispanic and Latino issues, particularly those dealing with Puerto Rico and immigration. Congressman, welcome to Global Perspectives. Thank you for having me this morning. Bienvenido. Gracias. So I want to begin by asking, uh, when you came to con you were first elected in 1992, you came to Congress, there's a lot, there's 435 members mm -hmm. of the House of Representatives. Why did you pick immigration as an issue? You know, interesting. Um, number one, I noticed that at my congressional office, many of the issues people were coming forward with were related to immigration. But then I said to myself, wow, there's 435 of us. And I kind of looked at all of us as MDs, right? General practitioners. And I said to myself, I think I better find something that I'm going to specialize right. um, and really commit a lot of my energy to try to reach a goal, right? And accomplish something for the good of the country. And no one wanted to take up the issue of immigration. This was 1993. Um, and so I said, I think it's a good place to start. And, um, and today, immigration is one of the key cornerstone issues, uh, whether it's reproductive rights or gay rights, immigration is a key fundamental issue um, that the candidates, and I'm really happy to see all of us, especially the Democratic candidates, speak about what they're gonna do to make sure that our immigration system is a fair one and one that keeps us safe. Uh, you mentioned uh, doing something that was uh, for the good of the country. Now I want to go back to that and something a little bit more controversial. You were Puerto Rican or of Puerto Rican descent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, were you born in Puerto Rico or were your parents? So I was born, my parents were born in Puerto Rico. They came in 1952, uh, I believe to New York City. And then my dad moved to Chicago, brought my mom along. So yeah, I was born in, so this December 10th, uh, I'll be 66 years old. And it'll be 66 years ago, I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Well, happy early birthday. Thank you. Um, the, the, the question goes to your, your Puerto Rican descent and you take on the issue of immigration. Were there uh, challenges with that perception-wise in the Latino Hispanic community? Well, you know, it's in, thank you. Uh, interesting. So Puerto Ricans uh, are born citizens of the United States. So my father was born a citizen and my grandfather was born a citizen of the United States of America. Yet, they share many of the same challenges uh, and same discrimination um, that immigrants, but they're migrants, right? So they migrate from Puerto Rico. So if we were to go to 1952, when my mom and dad arrived in New York City, there wasn't a banner out there saying, welcome, so happy to have you from the island of Puerto Rico. Quite the contrary. Uh, the politicians were trying to figure out how to uh, stem the flow of more Puerto Ricans to the city of New York. There were these articles and fears about tropical diseases. They were all going to be on welfare. My dad and mom came to get on welfare. They were criminal. They were bringing tropical diseases. And I guess your TV audience might ask themselves, sound familiar uh, to the kinds of challenges to immigrants today um, when the president kind of comes down and says, I'm running for president of the United States, and by the way, I'm running, because all those murdering, uh, rapist, drug dealing Mexicans. Um, it's, not, it's not that different. And so my parents also had the challenges of language, right, of poverty, of, of just, just adopting and, how want I say it, um, integrating themselves into the fabric of society and the resistance uh, to them. And so I kind of said to myself, wow, Maybe there wasn't someone to stand up for my mom and my dad back 66 years ago, but I'm going to stand up for people that live the same situation that my mom and dad confronted. Because, you know, I think they did a pretty good job. Um, they raised me, they raised my sister, they worked really hard, and they contributed. Thank you. So you're talking about the rhetoric today and in 1952. Yeah. In that time in between, though, there was a, there was a sense among a, many people that there were, had progress had been made. Sure. So are you surprised at the rhetoric? Is that accurate, first of all, and yeah. are you surprised at where we are today? Yeah, so progress has been made. You really saw it after Barack Obama's re-election to President of the United States 
the Senate passed a comprehensive immigration bill, which would have given a pathway to citizenship. Now, just for your audience, it would have taken 10 to 15 years right. in that pathway to citizenship, but there was a pathway to legalize the undocumented, and oh, at the very end, they threw in an extra $30 billion just so that they could have more border security, smart border security. It might have even included some fencing. Um, that was the deal, but the Republicans in the House of Representatives refused to take up because part of the glue, the fabric of the Republican Party is to be anti-immigrant. Now, if we remember when Romney lost in 2012 to Barack Obama, there was the political autopsy of the Republican Party. And one of the central findings was, we just can't be this mean to Latinos. We can't continue this anti-immigrant rhetoric. And then you see 67 senators, right? actually approve a bill. We don't get it passed in the House. The House is a different kind of political entity and monster. And so we don't get it passed. So there has been progress. Then it seems to me that our current president is just trying every last anti-immigrant uh, position that he can, which is an accumulation, right? So the president is actually not original on this issue. I mean, the know-nothings and the uh, in the 19th century right. were just like this president. Um, we have always had immigration tied uh, to partisan politics. In Florida, you know it best. I mean, it was politics that drove the policies towards Cuban immigrants uh, to the United States. It is the, uh, how would I say it, the, uh, the most generous uh, um, immigrant policies that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, yet if you come from Haiti, you're deported immediately. If you're a child or a family fleeing repression in Guatemala, Honduras, in Central America, well, they put your children in cages. That's not an exaggeration. We know that's happened, and you get separated from your mom and dad as you're fleeing tyranny there. So I think we have to come up uh, with a new um, how would I say it, evaluation of when people come here, a dictatorship um, and a despot that takes away your fundamental human rights, that jails you, that's bad, and we should have policies that are very clear that accepts people fleeing that situation. But look, a gang, a cartel that controls the country and controls the very fabric of every thing in that society that makes your daughter into a prostitute, that sends your son out to sell uh, drugs, uh, that murders anybody that uh, defies them, sure. and there is no rule of law. And lastly, why don't we have a responsibility, a hemispheric responsibility? I mean, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, they're not coming from Nicaragua that much, right? They're certainly not coming from Costa Rica. You can look at the other Central Correct. American countries. Why are they coming? Because that is the new little drug triangle, right? What fuels that drug triangle? Is it the consumption of drug locally in those countries? No, it's the exportation and the demand for those drugs in the United States of America. If you stop the demand for drugs in the United States of America, you're going to have a much better chance of establishing a more society and a much more stable society. And so we have a response. It's really hemispheric, right? The drug dealers and the cartels are the enemies of the Americans that are dying because of, right. the, of the drug addiction and of the people in those countries. Why don't we have a common enemy? You know, you talked about dictatorships, and uh, an interesting point, going back to uh, President Barack Obama's decision on the wet foot, dry foot, uh, what, what is your take on that? Because they're Cubans, and uh, going back to Cuba and the whole Venezuela, and you talked about dictatorships, how does that play into your perspective? So when I was in Congress, I supported a, a lot of measures uh, that supported the embargo. And then I said to myself, wow, maybe there's a better way of doing this. Why don't we just, I don't know, trade? 10,000 American students go to Cuba for a semester and you send over 10,000 Cuban students over. Why don't we talk and communicate? Uh, we're doing, look at all, I mean, in the state of Illinois, at the University of Illinois, I remember when my daughter was at Champaign-Urbana, there were dozens of Chinese students, 
right? Um, and there are more and more coming to our universities every time. Um, why do we have that kind of philosophy with a communist dictatorship in China and we can't have one with Cuba? And I, I say that for the following purpose, that I think in communications, right, and in trade and in ideas and in people, you're going to find harmony, right? Um, and so I see that more and more. So when I saw the president, I said to myself, wow, there are literally every day planes of former Cuban um, refugees who are now American citizens who return to the very country uh, that they left because they said it was a dictatorship and that they had to leave and seek asylum in the United States. Well, why are they returning to that country um, if, it, if it's the country that they left seeking refugee status from? So I said, you know, it's a new dynamic, right? So let's look at that new dynamic. I was very happy uh, to see that we had open relations. I just think we need more dialogue and we need more conversation. Um, and less stopping people from communicating with one another. And I go back to the students. It's just, a, mm -hmm. it's just one example, right? I mean, those thousands of Americans would come back with a different view of the Cuban society, and those thousands of Cuban students would go back to Cuba with a different. Too many times, government policies causes people to be at friction with one another, when in the end, I believe the people uh, should be the ones that, that, that should decide that. And, and communicating, we can do that. You, you mentioned uh, you're talking about immigration as well as the, the war on drugs, and you're connecting different elements. So these are these are problems that don't have easy solutions, sure and they're do. also connected to, to other 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 things. So when we're looking at immigration reform. Do you feel it's that the United States is neglecting to look at the conditions in these countries? We have other tools to use other than building walls, mm -hmm. for example, like foreign foreign aid. Mm -hmm that can help stabilize local economies? And, and is, are those tools being employed effectively? Well, they're not. As a matter of fact, this administration is cutting aid because they say, well, they're not helping us. They're not stopping those people from coming here. They're not cooperating. So what do we do while tens of thousands of Hondurans, hundreds of thousands of Salvadorians, Hondurans, and Guatemalans, we cut aid to the very countries that further destabilizes those countries and simply augments people leaving because they're fleeing literally for their lives. And I assure you that if you picked up the phone and you called 911 and a leader of the drug cartel showed up at your house asking you why you were calling the police on them, you'd flee that country too. I mean, it is what we do as human beings, right? So during the 70s and the 80s, we had the School of the Americas funded by the American government in which we would train the new leaders of Central America. These people became the new dictators and the new generals and curlers and murderers, literally in Central America. We funded the Contras. We funded the right wing in El Salvador. We did the same thing in Honduras. Wait a minute. Let's just pause. If we had hundreds of millions of dollars during the Cold War to quote unquote invest, right? in war, in civil war. Why can't at a time today, we can't invest hundreds of million dollars in establishing democracy, in establishing freedom? In was, establishing it, was, it, was it easier to justify, though, in those days, when, sure. you're, when you're in the dynamics yeah. of an ideological battle with the Soviet Union, as opposed to something that is supposed to help, you know, yeah. without an ideological angle, yeah. hook on that? But at the same time, let's remember, that the guns are American guns in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. The money is American dollars in those countries. It's our dollars, our guns, and our consumption of drugs that fuels this. You stop the consumption. It isn't like you know the drug cartels are showing up in the United States and says you must buy these things. Right. There is a demand for them. And you know, they want to have all these wars. Well, obviously the war on Drugs has been a pretty bad failure. And now we see it only exacerbated, don't we, uh, by the prescription drug abuse that we see. And so I'm happy to see that in America, the new fight against drug addiction 
isn't one in which we say, we're going to have harsher sentences. We're going to send you to jail for more time. No, it's looked at as a disease, right? And it looks as people that are hopeless. And I can get it. You know, if I got hurt and I worked at a Ford plant or a GM plant and my, I don't know, $45, $50 an hour job disappeared and my life, and now I was forced to work for eight, nine, ten dollars an hour at Walmart. Wow, I don't know how that would, I would see the houses around me, the society around me. I don't think we did a good enough job. Look, I am, I'm proud of having voted against the North American Free Trade Agreement. And one of the reasons I voted against that back in 1993 is because I thought it would be bad for workers. But let's be clear, we didn't take care of a lot of people, right? In, o in Ohio, we didn't take in Pennsylvania, in the Rust Belt, in Michigan, their jobs were disappearing and we didn't do enough uh, to respond. We saw that, that suicide rate and the deaths, right, of white males, right? Their lifespan was diminishing. We saw these things, but why didn't we do something about it? So I look at myself also as responsible for not having done more. So let's look at the real causes and as you said, they're interdependent, aren't they, yes. right? Something happens here and, and something happens there. So let's fight it all together. Uh, going into the Caribbean now, can we talk a little bit about um, your perception on the situation in Puerto Rico? What you used to think, what you think now, and what has shaped that? Well, look, so Puerto Rico is facing an unprecedented challenge. And it's at two different levels. Number one, Hurricane Maria devastated the island. I live in Puerto Rico now, have lived there since April of this year. The electricity goes out about once a week, right? Not an hour, sometimes three hours, but it goes out. Water doesn't always flow to your residence each and every day. Um, I see in Puerto Rico, the minimum wage is the wage. And so income disparity uh, is even more blatant on the island of Puerto Rico between the wealthy and those that do have money, right? Uh, the plutocrats that control the government because of their money and their influence, influence and those that are working. Um, and so we have many challenges. The second one is the debt. So then they put, so you got Hurricane Maria, then you got a, a control board. So you have a fiscal control board imposed by the Congress of the United States over the island of Puerto Rico, which has more power than the legislature of Puerto Rico, than the governor of Puerto Rico, and dictates. Um, we need to deal with the debt, and we need help in dealing with the debt, and we need help in restoring our energy grid and our water grid, and we need to supply the people of Puerto Rico with the tools so they can create jobs. Because in the end, it's about creating jobs and economic wealth and the ability for people to go to work, feed their families, have a sense of pride and self and, and self dignity, right, in what they do that's going to resolve this. So I would like to see focus, but until you how are you gonna have people come and invest if you don't have water and electricity that is reliable and roads and transportation? Mm -hmm. And secondly, given the the crushing uh, weight of the debt how do you manage these things with that crushing weight of debt? So I would like to see um, um, more uh, help in terms of the infrastructure, but at the same time, I would like to see Puerto Rico given the tools that it can create jobs. Do you well, think me... it should be a state? Sorry. <laughs> well, was I, was, <laughs> I was, yeah, I was, I was just gonna, she, gonna cut in and say so, getting uh, to so, the heart. So the yeah. issue in Puerto Rico is, so a uh, primary issue is the issue of status, right? Yes. There are those that believe in independence, <laughs> There's those who believe in statehood, and then there are the autonomous, the commonwealthers, right? And they're not exactly for the status quo. They'd like to see it developed somewhat. It would be unfair to say that they're simply for the status quo. So I think right now the urgency should be placed on economic development of the island. That should be our priority. Look, you want Puerto Rico to become a state? Okay. Uh, poorest state in the union of the 50 is Mississippi. Puerto Rico has half the per capita income of Mississippi. Um, 
do we really believe that you're going to integrate the 51st state given the fact that it has half the per capita income of the poorest state? I mean, just look at it from a practical point of view. I know there are those that are going to say, oh, no, Luis, but what about those that have given their blood? Uh, I get that argument. I'm trying to also say, if you really believe in statehood, wouldn't you want to develop an economy? Um, because you have all of this talent. I mean, the Puerto Rican uh, population is immensely talented, immensely educated. And so you have this immense talent. Let's put it, let's put it to good use, all of that education and, and being productive. Uh, independence is the same thing, right? When an independent country, I really think that we should begin in terms of the status issue uh, by having a new treaty a friendship, uh, cooperation, solidarity between the people of Puerto Rico and the people of the United States. Are you going to do that? Are you going to I introduced that legislation before I left Congress. Uh, someone had already introduced a piece on statehood. So I said, well, sounds interesting. They have statehood, but they don't have um, the other alternatives. So I introduced the other two alternatives. And one of the things I thought was, let's put the issue of citizenship to the side momentarily because I mean, this is Florida how do you take five million people who look at themselves as Puerto Rican and three million that live on the island and five million that live in the other states and say you're all gonna have different citizenship that is something that is not going to work it's going to be an impediment towards what you'd like to accomplish and so I say let's put that issue let's have common citizenship the EU has it, right? I can, if I was a member of, if I was in Spain, I could travel to Greece, and I could travel to Britain, and I could travel to France, and I could travel to Germany, and I could travel within the European Union. And they also have what? They have the euro, right? So why can't we have a common monetary and a common citizenship, but at the same time allow the people of Puerto Rico to develop, right? Uh, a more prosperous, a more autonomous, uh, a more independent and a more self-reliant. Let, let me a ask you though, though, what we're talking about the status question, and I, I follow your rationale on that, but, but one of the things that Puerto Rico has been consistently criticized about is the history of corruption in Puerto Rico. And it's not just the Puerto Ricans, it's also Americans who have been involved in Puerto Rico also, right. which begs the question, is it this, this status, this kind of murky status that is creating a culture of corruption that you just can't get through unless you have some clarity? Well, look, um, I think corruption in Puerto Rico, um, the people of Puerto Rico gave the world uh, a lesson in how you deal with corruption. When the governor of Puerto Rico got caught in a chat uh, uh, criticizing gay people, criticizing the poor, when his secretary of education was indicted and his secretary of health and human services was indicted. Uh, and he came back to Puerto Rico, he was met by a coalition of women feminists. And he probably said to himself, this is it, this is my crisis. These 12 women who are always, uh, <laughs> that was the beginning, Rosello, of your problem. But it wasn't, they were representatives of a greater. I went to the march. There were more than half a million people at that march. And he kept saying he wouldn't go. So the next day there were 700,000 people. And they wouldn't stop protesting, protesting, protesting. And until the governor finally said, you know what, I have to bend to the will of the people. So we dealt with it, right? Um, and I don't know how someone can be president of the United States and look at Puerto Rico and talk about corruption when he's leading one of the most corrupt administrations that I've ever seen. So when I look at everything, I say to myself, do you punish people? Do you stop them from having the tools of self-reliance, right? Of jobs and economic opportunity because there's some elected officials that are corrupt or do you follow them in their protest and in their, um, and then their demand uh, for clearer, more transparent government. I think Puerto Ricans are on the road uh, to having a clear, transparent government. Do you think that um, 
you know, you're on, on one side of the political spectrum, and despite of what side people are on, do you think that uh, there's a need for more representation of Hispanic immigration, uh, Puerto Rican issues in the United States uh, government? And, and what, what do you think, where do you think that's headed? Sure. We have only like a minute left. Here's what I think. It, I think November of 2020, is going to see, so first it was Mexicans are murderers, rapists, and drug dealers. Then it was, oh, we've got to stop the Muslims from coming into the country. Oh, what are those transgender doing serving in the military of the United States? And then there was a tax against the black. I mean, who hasn't this president attacked? I think you're going to see a coalition of people in which Puerto Ricans are going to pay a key role. Why? Because Latinos kept saying to themselves, well, he's not talking about us because I'm not illegally in this country. I was born a citizen of the United States. If that's true, how do you explain the terrible response of the federal government to the crisis of Hurricane Maria on the island of Puerto Rico, right? He treated us as he treats everybody else, poorly in a very shabbily way. Well, I want to thank you for thank joining you, us today, Congressman Luis Gutierrez. And I want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on Global Perspectives.